Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Today, we are sitting down with NCAA All-American, World Championships medalist, and kind of funny human being, <laughs> <laughs> Debatable. Laura, <laughs> Laura Sogar. Laura, how's it going? Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great. I'm so excited to be here and talk about swimming. It's been a minute. Tell me about your aquatic relationship as it stands currently. Do you still swim at all? Oh, listen, I live in New York City. There, This place is famous for a lot of things. Having a ton of pools, not one of them. So uh, no, not really. I, I love swimming. I wish I could swim more, but it, I don't really want to get on a subway for 40 minutes in order to do so and then be like chlorinated on a subway on the way back and all set. I'll just go and I'll go on a walk, you know, <laughs> uh, but I love swimming. And whenever I do have the opportunity, if I'm like traveling and there's an outdoor outdoor pool, then I'm like, oh, love to grab some time. I'm so slow now. Whoa. <laughs> I I was just about to ask, like, be honest. Are you one of those people who can just like hop in after months of not swimming and like rip, uh, you know, 28, 50 yard breaststroke or something? Absolutely not. I do have strong legs still because in, again, I live in New York, so we're walking all over the place. So my kick isn't my kick is OK still. But um, it turns out your joints don't just naturally move like that found that out. So if I try, if I tried to sprint a 50 breaststroke or something like that, I'm going to feel that for three months, <laughs> three months. So you know what? I think we're all set. I think we can just, I'll, I'll move around, burn some calories, get a little sun, move my joints. It's all we really need. <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems like a healthy balance. And yeah, I, I feel like that's a great thing, especially for swimmers with the grind they go through during their career. It's like, yeah, maybe just take a walk for it's like five, five or 10 years after. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's all, it's all good. We, there's just no need. Um, but like looking back, I'm like, I genuinely, I'm like past Laura in a past life was a superhero. How did I do that? How did I swim that much? No idea. I genuinely have no idea how, that we, how we pulled that off. So good for everyone who's still doing it. I don't, I did, really don't get it. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's pretty incredible looking back. I mean, I had like the most, mediocre swim career you can you know it's just like very average very normal you know and it was just like what how and why did i commit so much time to that this brings me to a point i wanted to bring up which you spent your formative club years with chuck bachelor at, <laughs> at bluefish in rhode island which how and is why known. <laughs> you're great that's a very great point i, I love chuck Oh my gosh, he's just one of my favorites. Um, bluefish, a lot of staring at a black line at the bottom of the pool. It's kind of their thing. I don't know what they're doing. Well, now he's down at, um, I believe he's at Swim Max. Swim Max. Yeah. yeah. So um, not sure if he's changed his training program. My gut says probably not. But yeah, we did the most insane workouts. I do have to say, though, I think at the age, like a lot of his swimmers are obviously in high school. And he has really repeatedly just really, really strong athletes coming out of that program. And I think in high school, especially, you're obviously getting the physical benefits of just, you know, human beings aren't really meant to be swimming. So just being exposed to more and more swimming, you get better at it over time, right? But also there's the specific mental toughness that you eventually unlock after like our 50,000 or so, I don't know, I'm making it up. There's a, eventually something breaks and then you're like, oh, like whatever. Like now my mental toughness is, oh, I don't care. <laughs> oh, is it going to hurt? All right, whatever. I'll be fine. As long as I'm not going to literally have my life on the line, like we can handle it. We can do it. So it really makes it easy to work in an office, for instance, <laughs> You're generally not in physical pain there or um, be a little tired going to a stand up set or something like that you could push through quite a bit. And I, I really have to credit growing up on a very difficult club team um, and having that culture of just kind of like 
embracing the fact that in order to get better at something, you need to go through periods of being uncomfortable because otherwise your bo- your body doesn't typically make changes when it's just like happy and comfortable the whole time. Unfortunately, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> This is, you're like this, the, the perfect person to live in New York, right? <laughs> oh yeah. No, I'm like, phases right. you. <laughs> oh, is it cold? At least my hair's not wet and icicles on my head. Like, I'm fine. <laughs> we're fine guys. We're fine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I just, do you have a few sets that stand out to you from Chuck in, in the bluefish days? Cause I've heard some wild stories. Oh yeah. Oh yes. That was my club team. So I didn't really you don't know what other club teams are doing. And this was all before, like sometime I think maybe it just gotten started. Like maybe, like maybe in the first couple of years, it was um, old, it was a while ago. Uh, One in specific that I remember was we did, I think it was like one of the labor Memorial days. One of those days we had off and um, it was a holiday. So as a result, a lot of pool time was available and they just took advantage of that six hour practice. We did 44 four hundreds. That was the set. That's a really long way, guys. (laughs) That's infinity pretty much. (laughs) So I did that set and it was terrible. I mean, it was fine. Like we did it and we tried and honestly, it was so insane that it was like started to, it went past being bad to like started to get fun again, where we were like, what are we even doing (laughs) to, and then I had a recruiting trip that year. It was my, um, whatever the heck, junior year, whatever, senior year, I guess the fall. And um, I went to the University of Arizona. And I remember they like during the team meeting with the recruits all sitting there, they were like, and Laura earlier this week did 44 more hundreds. And the whole team was like, <gasps> like the amount of, I think fear I saw in their eyes looking at me. <laughs> they were like, don't come here. <laughs> don't bring that bad energy. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they were like, this is you? What you are have you a okay? sickness. <laughs> yeah, you are unwell. And I was like, listen, I know. Do you think I wanted to do that? No, <laughs> I'm so not. I complained the whole time, 100% of the time. <laughs> Especially but, as like, were they just all freestyle? Like, no, what was, was there a pattern there? <laughs> there? There was, it was broken up into, I mean, I, it's been a long time, so I don't remember exactly how we broke it up, but I remember it was like groups of six or something like that, like six and four okay. or something along those lines. And there would be like a kicking section and then a pulling section and then like a, a free IM section. He loved free IM. So no fly free instead. And then, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my God um and then i think there was like a stroke component so there was actually more uh frankly that one was it was really hard but there was more entertainment to that one than some of the other ones one other practice that we did um that really sticks out is i had to do a ten thousand breaststroke um uh, yeah and that is special it was it was uh, it was race don't give me it was a race <laughs> fast I was like, fast get out of here scram what are you talking about fast <laughs> we're finishing we're finishing it right. 10,000 and um that one was uniquely bad and this the 44 four hundreds like was entertaining because things were changing the whole time right you were on the wall with people where you could be like are you kidding me right now 10,000 breaststroke you're going <laughs> you're just going what is that like three Forever. hours it was something ridiculous like that. Yeah. Everybody, by the way, everyone did their stroke. So not everyone did. So everyone was doing like backstroke or I actually do think butterfly had some slight variation, but they did like a significant amount of butterfly. And then the freestylers were cruised through it, hopped out, or <laughs> walking around on deck and I could see them. And I was like, get back in the pool. <laughs> I was just, I was so angry. I remember one of the other girls who was doing it with me, she would, she went through a couple hundreds where she was yelling on every single one of her <laughs> strokes. She was yelling at Chuck. This is BS. <laughs> so he, like, I will say we were very honest about our opinions on things. Um, but I think that was one of the really great pieces of the culture with him is like, it was just, we, he asked us to do some really crazy stuff and we were like, this is insane, but we were doing it. Like we always did it. And, um, we got, we were fat, like I'm, we were very good. It was a really good cl- club team, especially at that point. We had like Beisel was there, a bunch of people were on the junior team. Um, you know, very significant presence at Olympic trials. Like it was working and we knew that we knew we had to do that, or at least it was working. So we weren't going to mess with something that was working. Um, and that mental toughness, I definitely think there was like a pride that came with it. 
Uh, but we we certainly didn't lose our spirit as part of it. <laughs> I <laughs> I can't imagine going through that and then and then going to college and being like, yeah, I want to do this for four more years. Oh yeah. Well, at that point, we were like, well, I'm pretty good. So I guess I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. I'm gonna keep going. Um, it was funny though because college swimming, I was like, I think I was one of the very few people who was like, oh, this is easier. You know, this is far easier. There were other aspects were obviously way more challenging. Like um, we didn't do a ton and ton of weights in high school. And um, I actually didn't do doubles. We uh, don't get me wrong. We made up for it because we just <laughs> do one. We did doubles. They were just together in a row. <laughs> they were right there. But like having to get up and like do the practice in the morning and then come back at night. So that was like some adjustments. But by and large, I was like, oh, this is like, no one's ever asking me to do something that like literally is making me scared. And then like, you know, that's a very specific kind of moment where you're like, I'm, I'm scared of this set. Yeah. And then you do it and you face your fears. And then afterwards you're like, okay, cool. As long as it's not harder than that. I have, now I have a new threshold of can do yeah. looking back. If you ask this body, I'm 31. If you asked me to do 44, 400s right now, I would die. I would die. I would perish. That would, I would be scared. So it eventually goes away. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do it forever, but <laughs> did, you did it once. I did it once. It's true. Um, Never. Did you have two different head coaches at Texas? Oh boy, did I. <laughs> <laughs> I swam for Kim Bracken um, when I first got there for the first three years, actually. And then, um, mm, things happened and we got Carol Capitani, um, who's still there. And I loved Carol. She's amazing. I won an NCAA championship underneath her and, um, had some of my best performances in long course as well. And so I'm, um, uh, as a post collegiate for a couple of years at Texas as well with her. And then Eddie was there the whole time. And, um, I did a bunch of training with the guys as well. Like I'd pop over and, um, he's obviously a genius. So as much time as I could get under that guy, I was always like, hello, please, anything you're saying, I'm writing down and putting on my mirror. <laughs> He's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, when Carol came in, what what stood out to you about her? You know, wh why do you feel like you were able to not only have some of your best performances, but as you said, win an NCAA title, have the desire to continue your career under her, especially, you know, after just spending one year with her? Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's funny because like, I feel like years ago, I really wouldn't have talked about this as much because I was like, oh my God, swimming and coaching. This is like the end all be all. Now I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> um, Kim really, her coaching style was very different than Carol's. Carol's an extremely encouraging person. And um, she asks us to do really hard sets. She's, I think she is one of, she writes some really fantastic sets, but the culture that she creates is very much like, we're human beings. That sounds bad, but like, it's very much like all encompassing, like, Hey, I want you to be successful as a human. And then afterwards, cause like eventually you won't swim, you know? And for me, I've always been pretty cognizant of that, um, with varying degrees of like knowing what to do with it, but a conscious of the fact that like, Hey, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm not just a machine who swims and then goes and like, you know, get points at meets and then go bed and then come back and swim again. That was definitely not the culture that I think the first couple of years at Texas I experienced. And some people do that and it's totally fine. I think we've seen a lot of um, things coming out around like culture from coaches and how people kind of just accept what the, what comes in front of them, because ultimately the coach is like responsible for the entire program and your scholarships and your, your social life too, because frankly, you're around all these swimmers all the time. Um, However, unfortunately, this like kind of more, hey, swimming is the end all be all. Everything is riding on this. You need to tons and tons of pressure. Uh, everything you're doing outside of the pool that's even remotely distracting you is wrong and bad. Uh, that kind of approach didn't work for me. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. I wasn't swimming my best under it. I still swim fine. Uh, and I also saw it have a really detrimental effect on a lot of my teammates, like a really detrimental effect. So my junior year, um, 
there. We we didn't have a performance. We had a really talented team. We didn't have the performance that we were looking for at NCAAs. And um, as a result, um, there were some discussions internally and they made the coaching change, which brought Carol around. And it was like a breath of fresh air. She really, really, she had to deal with a lot of us like being like very, you know, nervous and scared <laughs> women trying to swim fast. Um, but she did a really fantastic job, I think, of really building that culture into something that was much more positive and as a result has gotten some unbelievable performances out of people. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm just so proud of her because that was certainly not an easy task to walk into. Um, and I was very happy with myself for being able to very quickly say, OK, we're in a new environment. Figure it out and do your best. And I did. And it was successful. So. Um, it was nice to be able to be like plus one on the entire experience. So it's yeah. cool though. It's, it's wild seeing all the stuff that's coming out now around like kind of coaching culture from those 2000s eras. Um, things have changed. <laughs> things have changed. Th- things are changing. Uh, I think for the better. I, I am... think for the better. I'm very happy for the the people in the sport now. You, um, you have some unbelievable coaches who've been there for a long time, but then you also have people who I just think that their coaching style is a little antiquated. So. Agreed. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's nice to see a lot of the, the top coaches in our sport taking that all encompassing approach of we're humans, we're <laughs> students, we're athletes, you know, it's like the whole person. It is okay. <laughs> it is going to be okay. <laughs> like, Oh. Exactly. Um, so, so then after, after your final year of college, you know, again, you want an NCAA title. That's just freaking cool. Um, I yeah, don't think funny. people, people talk about how big of an accomplishment that is enough, but, um, it was what such a hard meet, my gosh, that meet is so fast. <laughs> it's out of control and so much like just the, the fanfare around it's a lot of pressure. But anyway, it was fun. That was one of my favorite ones. It was one of my favorite races. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that that's super cool. Um, so then how did your career progress from there? You know, the decision to be a professional, the decision to stay at Texas. Um, what did you see for yourself in swimming and what were you going for? Yeah, huh. weird times. So I think that, so I swam for three more years and I knew I was, I knew I was going to be done in 2016. That was never a question in my mind because I always like, I love swimming. I really enjoyed a lot of aspects of it, but I also love a lot of other things. And I was very conscious of the fact that my body was only going to do this for so much longer. And I was like eager to start the rest of my life. Um, but I also knew that I was really, really good. I had just gotten fourth at Olympic trials. Um, and I was consistently performing very strongly, um, in long course, especially. So I was like, I, I have genuinely have a really good shot of making this next round um and then getting the big official check mark and then ending in the whole deal um so then i went into swimming as a as a post collegiate i was uh, on the national team so i was able to compete at a number of other events like you know i went to uh, i went to worlds um the short course worlds in istanbul where i was able to get a silver medal which was pretty cool uh, went to World University Games where I got my butt kicked by the Russians in a, you know what, this is a swimming podcast, I'll leave it alone, but uh, <laughs> that was an interesting time. Doing some jokes on that if you want to come see me live sometime. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, had, so I had some really amazing, got to do the World Cups where it was so funny, um, if you're called G- Eugene Godso, um he is a great friend of mine. And at that point, like I knew him, but not super well, but we did like all these world cup circuits together. And we went to like Tokyo and like the Doha and all these like crazy places that I, I usually wouldn't, you know, have had exposure to. Um, and cut to a couple of years later, he's one of my best friends here in New York city. And he just moved to Austin. Actually, you should hit him up. Um, yeah, I know. Took him from us, but like (laughs) see him all the time kind of thing. So it was kind of crazy. Like it was a really fun time to be able to build a lot of relationships with, with people who are going through this very niche experience afterwards. Um, in terms of training, in terms of competing, I, I had ups and downs just like anyone. Like I had some, some 
swimming, like um, some races I was super proud of. And I had, like, I swam at, um, what the heck was it? Nationals in San Antonio, I think it was. I can't, 2015? In 2015, yeah. I think it was 2015. Yeah. And I just had, like, such good races. It was one of those ones where you, sometimes you have those meets where you're just like, Ugh, everything is perfect. Like, I am in shape. Things are clicking. All is going well. And then I had some other races that were horrifying. Like, so, so bad. And it's just kind of standard, you know? Like, that's how the, the year to year goes. Now, the problem with swimming is the timing of those can be absolutely impactful on your career as a whole. When I think the harsh reality is, like, you just are going to go through these ebbs and flows and your your life is changing. And I don't. it's not, obviously, there's people who, like, the Katie Ledeckis and the Phelpses and the folks like that who are, you know, they're tuned in to a point where they're able to consistently perform. But, like, I wasn't as good as them. Definitely not. I'm going to, I have like some extre- extreme physical abilities that were able to come out, but I didn't always have the ability to harness when it happened. And I think that was my biggest failing. Uh, in 2016, I was definitely the the top contender in terms of um, like times wise, I'd gone a time in, I think, January of that year that would have easily made the team. And then I had a terrible performance at trials, uh, which was like, probably made me so much funnier do you know what I mean? So <laughs> do you know what I mean? In the long I mean, run, kind of, who really won here? Like, uh, <laughs> ha ha, enjoy Rio or whatever the hell. Uh, jokes on you. Actually, jokes on me. Like, I get to do the jokes now. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, at the time, it was, like, devastating. And I was, um, I mean, it's still looking back, I'm like, whoa, that was a whole experience. But it was also, like, there's not that many people in their mid twenties who aren't going through a full crisis. Cause they're like, what am I doing with my life? And I was so unbelievably grateful. Like as much as I was not getting the like accomplishments I was looking for, or I was, but they were like, you know, always in striving for another goal. Like I was doing something that I was trying really hard at and able to really put myself on the line and look back and say, Hey, that was cool. I gave it my all. It didn't work out, but you know, at least I'm not just like cold calling at, <laughs> which is fine. Like, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but like, you know, at least happy hour is not the only thing going on in my life. <laughs> yeah. At least, at least you're not uninspired. You know, you got to do something, yeah, exactly. like you said, that, that you really enjoyed, which is, which is awesome. Um, I, yeah, I want to dive into a few of these things. World cup circuit, something else that we don't talk about, especially as Americans, I feel like there's the there was or at least there was kind of the stigma of like oh yeah world cups they don't really matter um but it was such a cool opportunity because as a pro you could make some serious money and get these racing experience and short course meters which we never ever 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 swim here um can you yeah. can you just dive in a little bit and tell me you know what you really enjoyed about seeing all these different cities like Doha and Tokyo and wherever else you ended up going and and the relationships you form with that group of athletes that kind of goes from stop to stop together. Oh my gosh. I think that was seriously one of the things I've most swimming. I really, really enjoyed for a lot of reasons, but one of the things I I love to travel, I love to see other cultures. And um, if someone else is going to pay for it, like, Oh my gosh, (laughs) all the better, you know? Um, And that was kind of all of those things coming together combined with the fact that you were representing your country, which is always like an incredible feeling and makes you feel very proud, a um, little nervous, depending on the country you're in. <laughs> but uh, by and large, a very, very wonderful thing to to do. So that was definitely, I think, one of my favorite experiences. It's good racing experience, too, um, because reality is that the other people who are going there are a lot of Europeans go there. Um, a lot of people from a lot of different countries are competing there. And you get to race against them. So your first race isn't necessarily going to be at a world championships where you're like, ah, this person from Sweden is going to like kill me. You know them a little bit more as a competitor and you're able to go and like see them in more um, full form than later on at like the the more high profile meets, like those long course meets. Um, At least that's the way I viewed it. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, a ton of people like the just stay and train and do local meets and only train long course, race long course. And they're doing fabulous. So there's a lot of different ways to look at it. For me, I always wanted to get as much um, out of swimming beyond just medals. 
maybe that's why I didn't do as well ultimately on that. Side. <laughs> but for me, I think that that was part of the reason that I liked and I enjoyed it was being able to have those experiences and see like when we were in Doha, we went to one of those um, like, what is it called? The souk markets or whatever it was with Felicia Lee and Molly Hannes. And we're walking around this market. First of all, like in our swimming gear, like, like we have like, we're covered up, but we're, we don't, we're, we don't look like the local women there at all. So that was already hilarious. And then we're looking at all the spices and stuff. And we came across this falconry where they were selling falcons, like, like, like Aladdin style, <laughs> like, yeah. like wearing little hats. Oh my gosh. It was, I was dying. I was like, this is crazy. First of all, in America, they would never, like, I don't think that would be, I mean, maybe they're, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are falconries I'm not aware of in the <laughs> US, but as far as I'm aware, there's no falconries here. And especially at that age, I was like very young and just like that blew my mind. I was like, this is, this is wild. And I'm with Felicia Lee, who's like one of my really, really good friends now too. I go, we just went to Breckenridge with her last year. Uh, I went to Machu Picchu with her. Actually, we hiked the Inca trail. She like conned me into hiking the Inca Trail. I didn't realize I was signing up to do that. I thought we were just going to Machu Picchu like via train, Venmoed her. And then I was like, oh, we're sleeping on the ground. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. Those kinds of relationships, like I would say that we're much better friends because we did those crazy like traveling at the World Cups and seeing all those like random pieces. And those are those are the memories I really treasure from swimming. The practices were, you know, they are what they are. Some of them are awesome. Some of them are horrifying. Uh, a lot of the swim, the t I genuinely don't remember my times. Like, yeah, no, <laughs> couldn't tell you. So I don't know. It's it's crazy. It's weird to see like a couple of years out now. I'm I'm significantly out, and what matters to me. I think that's um, a discussion that more people are having, but I think it's a great point to keep bringing up. Is like if you're an athlete, what are you going to prioritize of out of metals versus experience. Right. And it's like, yeah. hit to, you know, again, I, I was like a sectional level swimmer, you know, like I qualified for my high school state meet, but it's like, but what are you going to prioritize? Like enjoying your time or, you right. know, pu putting, putting all your eggs in winning X medal. Um, yeah. Don't get me wrong that there's, that's also very cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. Winning the medals is very cool. But um, in retrospect, I think if I'd won one more medal and didn't have those experiences, I I'd prefer my, my version now, even though it came with a ton of drama and stuff like that. Sure. And I, that's great to hear. You know, it's like that, that you're happy with your experience and how things went regardless. I do think it's hilarious that on your website, <laughs> It says, I'm a former professional swimmer who failed to make the Olympics. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm kind of funny. My stand-up comedy has been featured in the New York Times and Time Out magazine. Yes, I've met Michael Phelps. So you, you really just hit the I'm basic like, swimming points. <laughs> Didn't make the Olympics, met Michael Phelps. <laughs> Listen, uh, I think anyone who's retired and like was, you know, at the, that level has probably had exactly those questions. And like at this point, it's on my bio too, and my Twitter or like my Instagram. I'm just like, it didn't make the Olympics, but people continue. They don't know, <laughs> like they don't understand. They're like, she's an Olympian. And I'm like, like, no, like actually pretty significantly. No, <laughs> it's actually a big thing in my life, <laughs> but, right. but like, they don't care. They're just like, yeah, but Olympic level. And I'm like, it's different, but short. Okay. <laughs> just whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, my, my brother is, you know, qualified for trials twice. And like, all my friends are like, your brother's like an Olympic level swimmer. Right. And I'm like, sure. If you want to like, think that, like, why not? <laughs> and I mean, if you think of like terms of the scale of the world, what 8 billion people <laughs> right. Olympic level. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of, what is, what's the, what's the gradients that we're looking at here? <laughs> Exactly. Um, so transitioning to the funnier side of things, uh, you know, you stopped swimming. How did you get into stand up comedy, which which you are a big proponent of now? Yeah, it's fucking all I do in my life. Um, so I actually I've always loved stand up. I never knew that you could do it. You know, you could just do it. Isn't that wild? You just do it. 
there's like, no, there's literally nothing stopping you. <laughs> <laughs> I always, I don't know about you, but I always like, I loved it. Listen to it all the time as a kid. And I would, I assumed those people were like chosen or something. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right? It turns out you can just get a microphone and just kind of like get after it. Um, so in college, I started doing, or not right after college, um, I started doing improv comedy with Cold Town Theater. And uh, I knew about improv from one of my friends who is now a writer, a spin back. Uh, she's a writer in uh, LA now. So she's amazing. She's doing so well. And um, she did improv and I didn't even know what improv was. I just knew I loved comedy, but like, that was just something that like I enjoyed listening to. Um, I didn't even think I was very funny. I'm like, actually, I was like, probably not very funny at that point in my life. You know what I mean? I was very serious on occasion. Um, <laughs> Unless I had a couple of beers, then I was pretty funny. Um, but <laughs> sorry, swimming podcast. Never mind. Um, yeah, yeah, we're good. So then um uh she started taking these improv classes and I went to her show and I was like, what are you guys doing? And improv, if you're not familiar, is basically like uh whose line is it anyway? That's more improv games, but it's where it's made up on the spot and you create a scene with your scene partners and you're able to um, you know, put on a essentially like a little fake play that's meant meant to be funny the bad part about improv is that it's almost always not funny because people are very bad at it right so good improv is absolutely incredible there are like three good improv troops in the world <laughs> so most improv is really really bad but it's very very good for your brain to start learning how to do that stuff and what i loved about it is there's a curriculum and i love a syllabus come on i love a love a sign up love showing up getting a certificate it's great so I would go and I did some of those classes um, when I was swimming, actually, the last two years of my swimming career, I signed up for the classes and was um, um, going through the different levels. And I did sketch and I did uh, all the different improv stuff. And I never did stand up because I still improv and stand up are very separate. There's actually almost there's not animosity, but they're very much like, oh, like it's a different world. There's some crossover, but like for most people, like oh. you can't um, say with us. Yeah, you can't sit with us. Like, we're stand-ups. <laughs> but improv is very theater kid energy, and stand-ups are, like, mentally ill people. Do you know what I mean? So it's, like, different. I do. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> very different. <laughs> um, and I'm not a theater kid person. So I loved performing. I really loved performing. And I loved coming up with jokes and stuff like that. But I never really fully clicked with performing improv with other people. Because frequently I was like, you're not funny, though. <laughs> I'm like, why am I trying to do this with you? I was like brutally on. I was like clearly did an individual sport. <laughs> I was like, what? You're bad. So why am I? Why is my performance on yours? This is terrible. This is a disaster. So kept going. Moved to New York. Uh, I started meet. I met Matthew. Um, Matthew is my boyfriend. He is Matthew Broussard. He's a really good comedian. At that point, I'm very proud of this. He had nothing online. Like he had no comedy clips online or anything like that. I just knew he did comedy and he actually was the manager for the swim team in Rice at Rice. Um, random. Wow. Yeah. That's so you knew about my swimming. Manager. Big nice. fan of swimming. Really random. And I left comedy and um, we started talking, we started dating and I finished up my swimming career, that whole thing. And I was like, let's move, like, let's, you know, probably should live in the same city. Um, it was either LA or New York. And we both decided like, I, I applied for jobs in both places, had some options, both locations and was like, you know what? New York is one of those cities that you want to do when you're younger, because you just simply won't have the stamina <laughs> when you're older. So we're like, let's do it, move to New York. And when we got here, I started doing uh, UCB, which is Upright Citizens Brigade, which is like Tina Fey and um, Amy Poehler, like the really, really classic, just the Harvard of improv schools. Still was doing improv and I was like, did the whole thing, went through a bunch of different courses. Um, I was traveling a lot for work then. Then I switched jobs and was able to be in town more and was like, you know what? I'm going to try stand up. I was terrified of it, but I was like, I'm going to try it. I think that I'm going to regret if I like die one day and <laughs> never tried stand up so dramatic. Um, did it. And, um, couple months before the pandemic, I started doing, uh, I was starting to do mics and stuff like that. Really, really loved it. Loved the amount of control that I was able to have over my set. I was not funny, <laughs> but uh, it was not funny, <laughs> but I 
knew that I was coming to, like I was building these jokes out and that I was getting better. It's a couple months. It's like late 2019. I would say like winter 2019. See where we're going with this. <laughs> I'm like having fun getting into it. Oh, the world's going to end. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Okay. Maybe I'm not supposed to do this. Uh, yeah. Obviously March, 2020 hit um, a lot of things shut down. Amongst them, the entire city of New York, let alone the stand-up comedy scene in New York, was just just gone, completely gone. Um, and there were, so basically that put a very, very hard halt on everything that I was doing, which was like just the very infant first steps into stand-up comedy. Um, but I still really, really liked it. And obviously my boyfriend, of course, at that point, he is, he's a professional comedian. So I really saw the impact of the whole thing. It was like, ooh. Um, cut to a couple of months later. So everything stops. We were down in Florida for a few months, came back to New York. And that summer, um, that was the summer where they allowed drinking outside in New York. We were like, whoa, silver lining. Okay. And um, we started doing park shows. And um, shows like outdoors, which is not the correct setting for stand-up comedy. It really is just not where you're supposed to be doing that. But we did it. And Why is we that? Were, um, Del- delve into this. Yeah, yeah. The the a lot of reasons, but like the it's actually like the mechanics of a show matter quite a bit. Even if you're a really funny comedian, people need to be. The reason there's some like a lot of them are in basements and stuff like that is you want to have low ceilings and have everyone together and cool and ultimately with a drink, you know, and you want it dark so that people feel comfortable. They can laugh and they don't feel like uncomfortable that their freaking neighbor who they brought to the show is like, oh, you thought that was funny, idiot. Like, do you know what I mean? Like there's no judgment and the low ceilings helps the laugh reverberate. So it just feels fuller, the entire room, the experience kind of, and that just helps it snowball into being a really good show. So cut to a park at like 5 p.m. Which has none of those things. (laughs) Every single one of those things I described, none of it. Actually, now they had white claws. We had white claws. That was the one thing. (laughs) Disaster. It was just absolute crazy. And like, we're like talking with a stupid speak. We were one step up from subway performer. Actually, I did a performance on a subway, on the subway. That's that's when you know you're a true New Yorker, though. Right? I I mean, I need to reevaluate. It's like a rite of passage. (laughs) I was like, I need need to really check in and make sure I'm... (laughs) okay with this trajectory <laughs> and i was uh listen we did it we're here and still don't know if it was the right trajectory but we're doing it so it's, it is what it is so um we're going through we're getting better um but we're performing outside i'm doing like open mics outside those were actually weirdly better because um they are already so bad in new york as it is open mics is when it's like just like anyone can sign up when you're first starting comedy you're gonna do a billion of those and um Normally they're with like all men in a basement in New York that are like 22 and they think things that are cancelable are funny. And sometimes they are, don't get me wrong, but often it's like, (laughs) it's just not a pleasant experience. I could, that's a whole other podcast. Um, So that was point is that we developed quite a bit there. And then I started producing a show outside at a venue that was typically doing like rock concerts, Um, but it was an outdoor concert venue. And we were able to space people out and really do that and have it like be more legit. So I started producing the show and I found I was actually very good at production. I still produce now. Um, And that enabled me to get really good stage time um, much earlier than I normally would have. And then there were so many great comics who were able to come through because they were available because no one was traveling and no one was doing shows anywhere. So that weirdly helped me take significant steps forward in my stand-up career very, very early on. Um, it's very strange silver lining to that whole experience. I got a lot better as a result. And then that's that winter we still performed outside. It was like 30 degrees. We were performing like on rooftops. It was crazy. It was crazy what we were up to, but the community that kind of came up from that whole thing was like so intense. Like all the comics that I performed with during that time, it made us bond so much faster than I think it would have in a normal setting because no one was doing anything else. Thing else. We all knew this was an insane thing. And everyone who wanted, you really had to want to be there. You had to want to be there. Otherwise you wouldn't have shown up to the, the icicle rooftop. 
Also, cut back to relating this to swimming. Uh, still not as hard as 44 four hundreds. Still not as hard as 44 hundreds. I was like, sure, cool. This might as well happen. Who cares? Um, it kept going. Um, I was getting better over time. I was producing the shows. <laughs> In 2021, I got passed at Stand Up New York, which is uh, one of the, it's like where Jerry Seinfeld always performed. Getting passed at a New York comedy club, like a comedy club in New York is extremely difficult. Um, so that was a really good sign. Like I was getting laughs. I was actually doing fairly well. I'd been hanging out and like showing that I was trying um, to the people who were like in the industry. And um, they gave me, they were really wonderful to me. I was able to continue to perform there and continue to get better. I was producing my own shows. I was doing independent shows. Um, I got to do a festival uh, in Idaho. Um, New York Times wrote an article on all of us who were doing outdoor comedy. And I was like, the picture that they put in there was, was kind of cool. It was wild. Um, and then um, since then, it's just continued to grow and escalate since then. Uh, I stopped doing improv altogether. I started two podcasts and I I still work during the day, but I also, uh, I perform most nights, like multiple shows a night. I got passed at New York Comedy Club as well. Um, so I've just been trying to do as much stand-up as possible, um, do it when I'm traveling, do festivals and stuff like that. And it's um, it's fun because you can take that work ethic from swimming and apply it here, but when you're make, like making jokes about dicks and stuff, <laughs> like, it's, fun. <laughs> it's just so silly. And like, you can do it and people like, it. sometimes they pay you. I'm like, wow, what are you talking about? Probably made more uh, money. I probably made about the same amount of money from swim, uh, comedy as swimming now. No, not quite yet, but like, we're getting pretty close to. <laughs> oh, wow. Really? You, you made that much in swimming? <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> uh, I made some in swimming. We had a couple sponsorships that were good. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Um, okay, I am curious. You're a stand-up comedian. Your boyfriend's a stand-up comedian. Do you have to run your jokes by each other if you're making jokes uh, that are centered around, you know, your romantic partner? I mean, every relationship is different. I know a bunch of people who are dating stand-ups and it can absolutely go so toxic and it can be bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Matt is great and we generally know each other's jokes pretty well and what we're working on. So if there's something that would ever bother me, I would just be like, don't do that. And he's going to work around it. He's going to figure out a way that also makes it to where all the jokes he's doing. I'm like, all right, you can do them. I do have a couple of ones of them where I'm like, not in front of my parents. And once we had this big blowout fight because he was like, you are limiting my artistic expression. He was about to reform in front of my parents. And I was like, no, I don't care. Screw your artistic expression. I genuinely don't care at all about that. <laughs> look at my face. Does it look like it cares? It does not care. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and flip the switch and you're not doing those jokes or I'm going to throw a fit. You can choose. You can choose between those two options, but I promise you throw a fits right there. It's right there. <laughs> he chose option um, A, which was change the jokes or he just, he has hours of material. I was like, we don't need to do it on this one show, man. This is a random show, but my parents are here and he's probably going to beat you up after if you do that joke. So I don't know about that. That's also included in option B. So. There's a ripple effect here. <laughs> so. Yeah, I highly recommend. I, I'm looking into the future and it's just not going to work. So there's those kinds of uh, situations. But by and large, um, he doesn't write like I, I really like his comedy. Um, he's. He's very, he's doing really, really well, really, really well. He's opening like for Burt Kreischer. Um, he has been on late night television so many times at this point. Um, he's very good. Go check him out. Matthew Broussard, Monday Pande on Instagram. And um, yeah, so by and large, like his jokes, I'm always, I'm always like, oh, these are great. You know, it hasn't been a huge issue. Gotcha. Okay. That's cool to hear. Yeah. Um, is that more right? <laughs> <She's> funny. <laughs> funny and rich. Well is is it <clears throat> i'm curious what it's like to just constantly be seeking inspiration or just living and then you're like oh that could be a joke oh that could be a joke is that how it feels or do you when you sit down and write you're you're kind of much more um like purposeful about okay now i'm going to compose jokes so i think the biggest thing is sitting down and being like okay joke time what is funny some people it probably works for. For me, there is no way to make my thinking like more linear and uncreative than if I try to do that. I'm just like, um, 
for breakfast, I have, like, I have no idea. So what I like to do is when I'm just living my life and if I, something pops into my head or I feel an emotion towards something like just jot in the notes app, just jot it down. So then when you do go sit down to write, you have things to go off of where you can be like, oh yeah. And then it's more like, how do I, how can I structure this out to where it would potentially be funny? Um, this is an area that I have so much learning still to do. So now at this point, I've been doing comedy for about two years or so, plus or minus months because of pandemic and gaps and who knows, whatever. Um, so I'm still considered like very young in the whole thing. Very, very young in the whole thing. Um, then I have compared to Matthew on the flip side, who is like over 10 years in at this point, And he's got a whole structure and like much faster at the whole thing, uh, of being able to develop jokes and understand how to structure them, things like that. So I've been able to see the way that he does it. And that's helped kind of mold me in that way. And I've also appreciated the fact that my brain just needs to continue to learn and to develop over time. And I've gotten a lot better at it. I've gotten a lot faster at it. So it's one of those things that you have to just do it frequently. The other thing with stand up that I think is cool is um, performing is it's like going to practice and it's going to practice, but you have to like fight to be able to get pool time, like really fight. It's extremely competitive in New York, extremely competitive. So, um, the more I can get myself to go up, the just better I'm automatically going to get, because as you're doing the jokes, you can understand like, Hey, even when I was writing that, even though I thought it was funny, it's like, just really not funny. <laughs> it's not funny. No one likes it. So stop doing it or change it. And then you can go back to the drawing board with that information and know what to do or mm -hmm. not know what to do and figure it out. So. That's that I found that incredibly insightful. Thank you for for Good. sharing your creative process. Um, I am just curious because at, we discussed this earlier. You and I have both lived in Brooklyn and in Austin. Um, I just, I'm, I'm just curious about your favorite things about each city. You know, what do you miss about Austin? What do you love about New York? What do you hate about Brooklyn? <laughs> yeah. Well, Austin, I mean, the, the food there, people talk a lot about New York food and don't get me wrong. There's parts that are really, really good. But man, the rest of the country is some pretty good food too. And Austin, Texas is a special place. Like the Tex-Mex there is unbelievable. Um, I will say I've lived in New York now for five, six years, like a while, five years. And Austin has changed a ton since I left, like a ton. I went back there and there's an Hermes store on freaking South Congress. I was like, like what's going on here? <laughs> it's cool. I understand that obviously cities need to change and like, it's good for the economic situation there that there's clearly like a lot of like really high paying jobs and like um, it's developing, it's developing into a more major city. Like for sure. When I got there, there was like five flights, no, not five flights, but it was like not a thing. Um, so that's been kind of crazy to see. So I think nowadays, I don't know if I would enjoy living in Austin quite as much just because I don't really love like the tech bro vibe necessarily. San Francisco is a little exhausting. It's super fun. I love visiting my friends, but just to be surrounded by like tech, tech, we're doing tech like all the time. <laughs> and it's very, um, it's not diverse at all. Um, in the sense of like, there's different races and stuff like that, but it's all, everyone's doing one thing. You know, there's one industry that's like very, very predominantly represented by most of the people. And that gets pretty tiresome. New York, one of the things I really, really didn't realize would be so cool to me, but I love is um, there's true diversity in like almost every sense of the word. There's super poor people. The rich people that I didn't realize could be that rich are here. It's crazy. There's also the, everyone here is doing their, like their, at the top of their game, pretty much, um, the different fields that are represented. So like, you'll meet someone who is a ballerina and if they're a ballerina here, they're one of the best in the world by far. Do you know what I mean? And it's the same in every single industry. The lawyers here, best in the world, best in the country for sure. Um, that's cool. And that's really inspiring. I do think though, that leads into one of the things that does I don't hate it, but it's, I mean, it's like part of the reason that New York is New York, but it's very hard is that um, extreme, everything is 211. 
like the extremeness of the culture here of the the grind culture people the hours some of these people are working like i didn't realize you could do it's actually maybe that does kind of scare me more than my practices growing up <laughs> that the work that the finance bros and the the lawyers and stuff like that they're in the office till three in the morning and then they're back the next day at like seven it's nuts and i have friends who are doing that and i'm like i genuinely don't know how your body is is working or your brain i don't know how you're doing it good for you i guess <laughs> <laughs> the consultants they're just living on planes i'm like how are we how are we pulling it off um so that's the kind of thing where i'm like it is a little tiring. Um, but it's part of, you know, to be the best, you have to work really hard. So it's inspiring, but it's also some days you're just like, okay, <laughs> whoa, I think I need to go to the beach. I think I need to go to Florida for a second and just chill out because I'm going to have a panic attack. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, yeah. So I think that probably covers what I love about, it. yeah, I don't know. Do you agree? What do you think? You live in Brooklyn for a year. I, I, that ultimately, I think that's why I left, you know, I lived with two of my best friends and it was awesome. And awesome. we, you know, went out and would get food and drinks like all the time because there, there's so many different options. I love the diversity. We live right next to a park and it was like, there was always just kids playing and families being happy there and, yeah. you know, things going on. There was always markets, um, there was a coffee shop like right across the park, you know, it was just, it was a lovely neighborhood. Um, but it's just intense, you know, it's just, it's hard to relax. It's hard to, I'm, I'm just, I'm used to a slower pace of life. And, uh, when yeah. People say they don't like New York. I'm like, I get it. It is so not for everyone. It's so not for everyone. You know, this city is every single moment. It's trying, it's trying to kick you out just the whole time. And you gotta be like, ah, no, I'm not leaving. It's like, oh, <laughs> trying to kick you out, trying to kick you out. So <laughs> you just have to be really good at standing in the doorway. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely. Some days that's easier than others. <clears throat> I I can imagine. <laughs> um, well, Laura, thank you so much for your time. It's it's been thank really you. awesome getting to hear about your swimming, about your comedy, about your life. Um, just I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and chat. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And if you guys, people listening, if you want to hear more rambling from me, um, I run a podcast called Risque Business News, where me and May Plannert, um, my co-host, talk smack about the business world. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> it's so fun. So if you want to hear uh, me make fun of Elon Musk, oh, oh, I do a lot of it. Oh, buddy. <laughs> so. <laughs> That sounds fantastic. You can also just follow Laura at Laura Sogar on Instagram. Uh, let's see. At She Does Stand Up Too. Is that your other podcast? That's my other podcast, which is just, it's like a very inside baseball uh, podcast about the stand up scene in New York. We interview some like unbelievable comedians. If you, if you're interested in the stand up world, I do actually highly recommend it, but it is. It's about like stand up comedy. Like it's very, it's focused, you know, but it's fun. We interviewed Dan Soder was on it. Um, we just had Rafi Bastos, who's like the freaking most famous person in Brazil. <laughs> Seems like he's extremely, he's really, really, really funny. Uh, Jared Free was just on it as well. Um, Taylor Tomlinson's done it. So it was, it's a really cool, it's a fun, it's a fun one. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.